our study of Deuteronomy chapter 4 today, which is my personal choice as perhaps one of the 10 most critical central chapters in all the Bible for understanding the God of Israel, for understanding his attributes and his character, the principles that undergird all of his laws, what happens to those who do obey, what happens to those who rebel, what the proper response of a worshiper ought to be to our redemption and our deliverance that he's given to us. Now last week I took several minutes to remind you of just why it is that particularly in our day and age is it is incumbent upon us to recover the Word of God to to stop relying on worn out and misguided doctrines and traditions of men that admittedly perhaps served a useful purpose for a time in salvation history but at the same time it discarded the Torah and it discarded Israel in favor of intellectual philosophies and the preeminence of Gentiles. Now, one of the most disturbing things, I think, that's been taught by Christians since about the time of Constantine, 4th century AD, is that the attribute of God that Christians most rely upon, his grace, came about only at the time of the advent of Jesus Christ, and it wasn't in play before then. And therefore, grace is strictly a New Testament phenomenon, or to use another word, dispensation. And this belief shows up primarily in the firmly entrenched church axiom that the greatest choice that is laid out to every human as regards our relationship with the Lord is to select between his law and his grace. That to choose one is the right way, to choose the other is the wrong way. That law and grace are mutually exclusive, they have no connection between them. In fact, law is antagonistic to grace. That to choose law is to deny Christ, to choose grace is to accept him. And naturally, since pagans and atheists have no concept of either of these terms, law and grace, this challenge is rooted primarily as a repudiation of the Jewish people. Or better, Gentile believers are to make a choice between the way of the Jews, the law, or the way of Christ, grace. But is that really the choice that's set before us? Is it that the law is the enemy of grace and grace the opponent of the law. I ran across a wonderfully articulate statement that puts this dichotomy of law versus grace into perspective. And what makes it all the more interesting is its source. I'm taking this out of the one of one of the more progressive, modern, scholarly, and admired commentaries on the Bible, the World Bible Commentary. This multi-volume work is re recommended by most contemporary evangelical seminaries and Bible colleges as perhaps the ultimate, the most up-to-date Bible commentary in existence today. And it was only published a bit over ten years ago. Dwayne Christensen, the editor of the World Bible Commentary volume on Deuteronomy, is anything but a conservative-leaning person, or an apologist for Israel and the Jewish people. His training is from MIT and from Harvard. So I don't think I have to say any more. Professor Christensen speaks of an undeniable reality that the Lord has shown him about the Old Testament. And he wants other Christians and serious students of the Bible to benefit from it. So I quote him. The popular view that identifies law with the Old Testament and gospel with the New Testament will certainly not stand up against a careful reading of the book of Deuteronomy, as G. Brawlick has shown. To understand Deuteronomy, one must recognize God's prior grace to sinners, that is, the priority of gospel, grace, 
over law in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. Though Deuteronomy stresses that obedience to God's Torah is essential, it even more strongly emphasizes that that obedience is dependent upon the grace of God. Let me say that another way. God's grace is contained within his law. His law demonstrates his grace. His law and his grace are inseparable. And the proper spirit of obedience to and carrying out of the law is predicated on grace. Speaking of one without the other is like speaking of Yeshua and the Holy Spirit as though they're mutually exclusive. That Yeshua or the Holy Spirit could exist and function without the other, or that the redemptive process is the exclusive work of one and not the other, is unthinkable. It would defy every biblical tenet of just who God is. Remove the work of the Holy Spirit and our salvation cannot be. Remove the work of Yeshua and our salvation cannot be. I mean, we can speak of Yeshua and of the Holy Spirit separately. We can study them separately. We can discuss them in isolated fashion, even apply different terms and characteristics. But practically speaking, they can't be separated. God, over and over again, says that he is a chad. He's one. He's a divine unity that can't be broken apart. We are treading on dangerous ground when our doctrines seek to emphasize or even prefer one characteristic or one person of the Trinity over the other. Even to go so far as to say that one could exist and operate and another cease to exist or no longer have a meaningful function in some particular age. So it's the same with law and grace. We can, to a degree, identify the somewhat unique purposes and attributes that are inherent to each of these. But we can no more choose between law and grace, or law and gospel, as is almost universally demanded from us by mainstream Christianity, then we can choose between the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. Rabbi Baruch and I were discussing this exact subject at length over in Israel some time ago. And I told him that it occurred to me that the mainstream church has become so willing to do exactly that, that for a believer to simply determine that she or he will be obedient to God's commandments, or even to take them seriously, is now called legalism. Very negative term. Or you're even accused of a desire to adopt Judaism. So please take today's opening remarks as a reminder of the context of Deuteronomy, and all the Torah for that matter, that grace is at its core. That grace is indispensable in all of God's, every stage of God's interaction with humans in any age. And that the laws contained herein are organically connected to, they're built up upon, they're dependent upon God's grace. In God's economy, without grace, there can be no law. Well, let's reread some of this marvelous chapter that's so essential to our understanding of the word in general. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Uh, we're going to start at verse 21, which if you have a complete Jewish Bible is on page 201. Deuteronomy 4, verse 21, starting there, we're going to go to the end. But Adonai was angry with me on account of you. And he swore I wouldn't cross the Jordan and go into that good land, which Adonai, your God, is giving you to inherit. Rather, I must die in this land and not cross the Jordan. But you are to cross and you're to take possession of that good land. Now watch out for yourselves so that you won't forget the covenant of Adonai, your God, which he made with you. And 
make yourself a carved image, a representation of anything forbidden to you by Adonai your God. Because Adonai your God is a consuming fire. He's a jealous God. When you have had children and grandchildren and lived a long time in the land and you become corrupt and made a carved image, a representation of something, and thus done what is evil in the sight of Adonai your God and provoked him, I call on the sky and the earth to witness against you today that you will quickly disappear from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days there or will be completely destroyed. Adonai will scatter you among the peoples, and among the nations to which Adonai will lead you away, you will be left few in number. There you will serve gods, which are the product of human hands, made of wood and stone, which can't see or hear or eat or smell. However, from there you will seek Adonai your God, and you will find him, if you search after him with all of your heart and being. In your distress, when all of these things have come upon you, and the Achrit HaYamim, the world to come, you will return to Adonai your God. You'll listen to what he says. For Adonai your God is a merciful God. He will not fail you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors which he swore to them. Indeed, inquire about the past before you were born. Since the day God created human beings on earth from one end of, the he of heaven to the other, has there ever been anything as wonderful as this? Has anyone ever heard anything like it? Did any other people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of a fire, as you have heard, and then stay alive? Or has God ever tried to go and take for himself a nation from the very bowels of another nation by means of ordeals and signs and wonders, war, a mighty hand and outstretched arm and great terrors, like all that Adonai your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? This was shown to you so that you would know that Adonai is God. There is no other beside him. From heaven he caused you to hear his voice in order to instruct you. And on earth he caused you to see his great fire. And you heard his very words coming out from the fire. Because he loved your ancestors, chose their descendants after them, and brought you out of Egypt with his presence and great power in order to drive out ahead of you nations greater and stronger than you so that he could bring you in and give you their land as an inheritance, as is the case today. Know today, establish it in your heart, that Adonai is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. Therefore you are to keep his laws and commandments which I'm giving you today, so that it will go well with you and with your children after you, so that you will prolong your days in the land Adonai your God is giving you forever. Then Moses separated three cities on the east side of the Jordan towards the sunrise, to which a killer might flee, that is, someone who kills by mistake, a person whom he didn't previously hate, and upon fleeing to one of these cities, he might live there. These cities were Betzer in the desert, in the flatland, for the Reubenites, Ramot in Gilead, for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan, for, the Mene for, for uh, Manesha. This is the Torah which Moses placed before the people of Israel. These are the instructions, laws, rulings, which Moses presented to the people of Israel after they had come out of Egypt, beyond the Jordan River, in the valley across from Beit Peor, in the land of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon, whom Moses and the people of Israel defeated when they came out of Egypt. And they took possession of his land, in the land of Og, king of Bashan, the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan towards the sunrise, from Aroer, on the edge of our known valley, to Mount Sion, that is, Mount Hermon with all the Arabah beyond the Jordan eastward, all the way to the Dead Sea, at the foot of the slopes of Pisgah. Picking up at Deuteronomy 21, uh, 421. After his diatribe against idol worship, Moses digresses a little bit, and he once again mourns the fact that even as the Lord's mediator, as one of only two mediators that will ever exist, he is not going to get to enjoy the fruits of the promised land as his youthful audience, the second generation of the Exodus, will. And that's because of the actions, the, uh, because actions of the Israelites prompted a rash behavior from him. Therefore, says Moses, take notice of what's happening to me. That is, Moses being barred 
from the promised land, take care that you scrupulously obey every element of the covenant that the Lord God has made so it doesn't happen to you. And this is because since the Lord God is a consuming fire, it's not possible for anything or anyone to withstand his judgment for wrongdoing. And the Lord is no respecter of persons. So your socioeconomic or your political status isn't going to help you. Not even Moses is exempt when it comes to trespassing against the Lord. With idol worship still front and center as the cause for Moses' words of caution to the people in this chapter, he says, be careful, don't break this commandment against all forms of idolatry and so perish as a result. Note that perish here doesn't mean utterly destroyed. Actually, it more means brought to ruin or severely and painfully punished and diminished. Now, notice something interesting in and it involves a principle that we really haven't seen used this way up until now. In Leviticus, it was a God-ordained requirement that any judicial trial that involved a matter that could result in the death penalty, it had to rest on the testimony of at least two witnesses. Such crimes were, of course, always considered first and foremost as acts of disobedience towards God, and it included the worst sorts of offenses, such as murder and adultery and idolatry. Now, I know some of you are prophecy buffs, so here's a tidbit that might interest you. Although we're not going to follow the thread of the two witnesses principle through the Bible and discuss it at length today, as interesting as it might be to do, I do want you to recognize that the mysterious, mysterious two witnesses that are supposed to appear during the time of the, of, of the tribulation in Jerusalem, the two witnesses of the Lord that the Antichrist is going to kill and then let their bodies lie in the streets of Jerusalem for all the world to see, these two witnesses are just an extension of the requirement that the Lord has set down that there must be at least two witnesses to judge a man for destruction, to judge for the death penalty. Here in Deuteronomy, Moses invites the two witnesses against Israel to be the heavens, or the sky, and the earth. Moses says he calls on the heavens and the earth as the two required witnesses against Israel should they commit idolatry, a capital offense. This two witnesses law was an absolute legal must in the Lord's justice system. One that God even imposed on himself. Which is why, in the end times, two witnesses is a must. Because through them, he's sentencing all unbelievers to physical and eternal death. Capital punishment. And since the punishment for idolatry is death. If Israel was to perish, because they were to be catastrophically chastised, as a nation, as a congregation, as a consequence for their corporate idolatry, who could possibly be left to qualify as two witnesses to testify against them? Moses says, I know, it'll be the heavens and the earth. They will be the two witnesses. So Moses says, it's not if, it's when you, Israel, it's when you start again worshiping idols that these wonderful promises of land and security and shalom, peace, are going to be reversed. In verse 27, Moses says that Yehovah will remove Israel from his land, and he's going to scatter them into other nations, all Gentile nations, of course, since there's only one Hebrew nation. And that while not all Israelites will be killed in those nations, many of them will. Many more will simply assimilate, and they will lose their Hebrew identities. In fact, Moses says only a few of them will survive the exile. Then he says something that I think has been a little bit misconstrued. Moses says 
that in those Gentile nations, Israel will serve man-made gods, false gods. Now, in general, this verse has been assumed to mean that the Hebrews will be persecuted and they'll be forcefully made to bow down to gods of those nations. Now, historically speaking, that's happened in isolated cases. It kind of demonstrated in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace when they were in Babylon. But in the vast majority of cases, Hebrews were not forced to worship other gods because that simply wasn't the thinking or the methods of the ancient Middle Eastern conquerors of the biblical era. Rather, the consequence was that the Israelites are going to do what all people eventually do. They'll assimilate to one degree or another into whatever culture they're exiled. Or just as ominous, they will not be permitted by that culture's government to openly continue with their well-established worship practices of Jehovah as it's outlined in the Torah. So they'll compromise so they can go unnoticed. Or perhaps, even worse, because by definition they'll no longer be residing on God's holy land, Israel, because the temple in Israel was the only place that they could go to to sacrifice and atone for their sins against God, their spiritual condition, their spiritual state, when they're outside of the land, will be as if they were defiled and never able to be cleansed. Worse, they were defiled, and in, since they were defiled and impure, this automatically meant they were unable to commune with the God of Israel. Now let me put that horror into perspective. It would be as though, as a Christian, you had your salvation yanked from you. He didn't want it removed, but it was anyway. You retain a complete memory of it. You know why it's so critical for you to possess it. You have a desire to maintain it. You didn't intend to lose it. But the consequences of your actions were so grievous to God that he turned you over to the forces of evil and then he separated himself from you. Can you imagine such a thing? Well, we're not going to get into whether that's even possible for a believer. And generally speaking, it's not. So relax. Just imagine if it was. That is essentially what Moses is saying is going to happen to Israel. And in fact, it did happen if they rebel against God. And by the way, the central trespass of this rebellion is committing idolatry. In my Hebrew Roots of Christianity seminar, I try to relate the state of mind of the Jews up in Babylon. How aware they were of their exile, not just from their homeland of Judah, but from God himself. They felt like the very air they breathed was defiled. The food they ate wasn't pure. It wasn't kosher. They, they, they lived in a perpetual state of uncleanness. There wasn't any escape from it. The women couldn't properly and legally cleanse themselves from their monthly cycles. Men couldn't cleanse themselves after sexual intimacy with their wives, as was required by the law. They couldn't obey the commandment to make the three pilgrimages each year to Jerusalem for the God-ordained biblical feasts. They couldn't tithe. The priests couldn't teach or perform their rituals. The Jews couldn't offer a sacrifice of atonement when they sinned. They were in hell. But Moses says, rescue and restoration is still possible for God's people. He says that if, as difficult as it might be to do in their circumstances of exile, if you will repent and if you will seek God with all your heart and soul, and remember now heart in the Bible, synonymous with our modern word mind, then he will allow Israel to rekindle their relationship with him. And this is because, as it says in verse 31, another attribute of God that operates at the other end of the scale from his wrath is his compassion and his mercy. 
He says that on a corporate or a national level, he will not let Israel be wiped out as an identifiable people. He isn't going to let it happen. He will not forget his covenant promise that he made with Israel's fathers. Man, this is so central to our overall understanding of the Bible. If we don't have this straight, the rest of it goes off the end of the earth. First of all, saying your fathers, just another way of saying the patriarchs. It's referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this has Moses saying that Jehovah will not fail Israel, nor will he let Israel as a people be wiped out. That he will not forget about the Abrahamic covenant. Covenant made with Abraham, then handed down to Isaac, then down to Jacob. And second, let's understand what the meaning of this concept of the Lord not forgetting the Abrahamic covenant is. See, to forget a covenant means to abolish it, to invalidate it. I want to have you let that sink in for a minute. Over and over in the Old Testament, the Lord says the same thing. He will never forget. That's a promise. He will never forget his covenant with Abraham, meaning he'll never invalidate it. Yeshua, of course, backs that up in Matthew 5, 17, when he says he didn't come to invalidate or abolish, or using this word, Old Testament word, forget the Torah and its contents, which is where the covenants are established. We see that again. In Hebrew, to forget a promise or a covenant is to abolish it, to abrogate it. To remember a promise or a covenant is to validate it, to uphold it, to stick with its terms. And particularly as concerns God, forgetting and remembering has nothing to do with his memory or his ability to recall it. Now I told you that Deuteronomy 4 is just crammed with important stuff. So here's another important concept that just kind of whizzes right by us. While you and I just read this passage and we say, okay, so God says he's compassionate and that wherever it is that Israel's scattered, he's going to allow the Israelites to seek him out. That's great. And that's pretty straightforward. Well, it's only straightforward for us because we understand that there exists only one God. The Hebrews in that era didn't believe that. Just as you and I wouldn't ever argue the point that the world consists of a multitude of various people groups, black people, brown people, white people, Asians, so on and so forth, so would the Hebrews just take as common knowledge that the spiritual world consists of a multitude of gods, each one, dedicated to one or another of the various people, groups, and their nations. So it's only that Yehovah is Israel's particular God. So in Deuteronomy, Moses is, for the first time that I can really detect in the Torah, beginning to make it crystal clear that Yehovah is the only God in existence. He's not just Israel's only God. So Moses is telling Israel that when they are scattered all over the earth for their idolatry, that they will commit, that they can take comfort in knowing that their God is going to be wherever they are. That unlike the universal thought of that era, the Hebrews will not have to switch allegiance to the God, to the gods of whatever nations they wind up in order to have some God or another to help them and protect them. That Yehovah's power and presence is everywhere on the earth. He's not restrained by territorial boundaries, as are these non-existent gods of the pagan nations. Now look, this was probably as difficult a thing for Israel to immediately swallow as truth, because it ran counter to what at that time just passed for common sense. As it is initially for new Christians to accept that divine attribute of God called the Holy Spirit. That it has invisibly and otherwise undetectably taken up residence inside of us. On the one hand, 
reliable church authorities tell us this is the case. And we sure hope that this is the case. But on the other hand, how do we prove it? How do we tangibly verify such a thing? The only way is through time and with experience with the Lord. But it all begins with a simple faith. So let's try and grasp what a revolutionary concept that Moses is talking about here. Let's also try and grasp that another part of what Moses is saying was ominously prophetic, that in the future Israel would rebel against God by means of idolatry. They will be ejected from the land and scattered. They will be killed and put under subjection in Gentile nations. They will be put under societal pressures to worship other gods. And many, if not most, Israelites will succumb to one element or another of this. Now really, Moses puts this in such general terms that only hindsight enables us to validate the truth of it. It's not that Israel would do this on one occasion and then God would respond to that with exile, but that what is being introduced to Israel is a principle that was going to be repeated in cycles. Israel would rebel in idolatry. God would each and every time respond the same way with exile from their land. But as always, Moses brings a balance to the situation. Restoration will occur just as surely as Israel will rebel. And beginning in verse 31, Moses says that the grounds for this hope of restoration and reconnecting with God that Israel should always hope for is twofold. First, because the Lord loved the patriarchs. He loved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And second, because God is inherently merciful. And from here, Moses gives a sermon about this radical concept that Yehovah is the only God that exists. This sermon that introduces Israel to monotheism says that the proof that there is only one God and that his name is yud heh vav -Hey, is contained in history itself. That from the time that the earth was formed until today, what society or culture has ever had such things happen to it as Israel? What society has ever actually heard the voice of God? Not just some priests claiming they heard God, but rather the general population being eyewitnesses or earwitnesses to it occurring. When has there ever been a God who set apart a selected group of people from the world in general, gave them a law and a covenant, brought down supernatural destruction on the oppressors, like Egypt, and then led them by means of a visible cloud and pillar of fire that was available not just for Israel, but for anyone within close proximity to actually witness Folks, let me explain something to you that perhaps you haven't considered. Do you know why Israel is looked upon as so strange and weird and threatening from the moment of their sanctification and separation right on up through today? Moses is telling us why in Deuteronomy. It's because they are different. They have had their path set upon an entirely unique history. They have a set of morals and principles that runs counter to any other society ever. Humans just can't stand diversity, and despite the absurd and disingenuous academic worship of it today, it's just not reality that people like it. At the same moment that the world calls for an acceptance of diversity and tolerance and multiculturalism, every effort is made to pressure everybody to be the same. I mean, my goodness, like no other time in history, there is the greatest effort to erase the distinction between male and female. 
pound everybody into the same mold. Everybody should accept the same philosophies and morals to have one world dominating body to govern all nations under exactly the same rules, exactly the same laws. And anybody who refuses to submit to this, well, you're a renegade, or you're unintelligent, or you're a hater. You're something to be stomped on like an unwanted cockroach. Moses is claiming that no one has ever been in Israel's position. No one has ever had such perfect laws and commandments to live by than what they were presented by by Yehovah. What he hasn't said yet is that the world is going to hate Israel for this. And that the world, as led by their own evil inclinations at Satan's direction, will never stop trying to rid itself of these strange people. Why? They're different. Well, wake up, Christians. The Jews aren't alone anymore. You have become a target for re-education or extermination. You are too different to live side by side with everyone else. And how has the church responded to this challenge? Generally in the same way the Jews eventually did, by trying to blend in, to look more like the world than the world itself. The majority of Jews worked to dissolve the separation between them and the other inhabitants of this planet. Jews who emigrated from Europe as early as the 1800s, gave up not only their Jewish identities, but also their family names so they could just kind of vanish into the sea of Gentiles. In our time, Christians by the thousands, entire denominations in mass, are giving up on the truth of the virgin birth, the deity of Jesus. Any vestige of separateness and differentness from the world. Christians by the millions are accepting and celebrating homosexuality. Same-sex marriage, our freedom to choose abortion. Christians don't want our faith history. We just want our saving fire insurance. We want our social group of friends and activities that's based around a church or a synagogue. And of course, I'm speaking in general. This isn't every case. But it is becoming kind of the new norm. The rush to abandon our Savior is at a fever pitch in Europe. And it's going to spread. England is leading the way. As a group now offers anti-baptism certificates. For real. So that Christians can officially renounce all allegiance to God. You can have your name officially removed from every kind of list that identifies you as a Christian, and then you actually receive a certificate as legal proof that you have repudiated Christ. Last year alone, 100,000 people did it. In verse 39, Moses makes this definitive statement. Know therefore this day and keep in mind that Jehovah is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. This statement marks a turning point in the history of mankind. And next Moses says that the reason you want to believe and to observe this commandment is so that it will go well with you and your children and then you can remain in God's care on God's land. If for no other reason, Israel, no other reason, I pay God for your own selfish reasons that you'll survive and prosper. Do it for that. Moses says, don't do this because you think God needs it. You need it. Don't do this because God benefits. You benefit. Nothing has changed. Salvation is not and has never been for God's benefit. It's for ours. God doesn't lose 
because so many fail to take advantage of his free gift, those humans who won't see the truth lose. Moses ends this portion of his address to the people by officially naming the cities of refuge, these sanctuary cities, that are going to be established on the east side of the Jordan River in the territory that Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh is going to inhabit. These are cities that will be owned and administered by the Levites, but for the sake of the tribes who have chosen to live and operate in the Transjordan. Now recall that a city of refuge is a place where a man who's killed another man can reside and be safe. He may not be harmed if he escapes to one of these three cities. And also recall that this law does not cover the crime of murder. So a murderer cannot take up residence there. The primary crime these cities are set aside for is manslaughter. The unintentional, the unintended, the accidental killing of another human. And it's not that those who come to a city of refuge are there to avoid prosecution. In fact, they'll be brought to a certain place for trial. And if they're determined not to be guilty of murder, then they can go back to the city of refuge and remain there in safety. The inhabitants of a sanctuary city are not in prison. They are actually there for protection. In fact, they're free to leave those cities anytime they choose. Problem is... They're be, being protected against the kinsman redeemer, the Goel Hadam, whose traditional duty it is to avenge the death of a relative who that person in the sanctuary city has accidentally killed. But if the killer chooses to live outside of the protection of that sanctuary city, then they become fair game. And the kinsman redeemer can extract his blood revenge without any consequence. Well, to end chapter 4, I want to make a quick comment on verses 49, 44 through 49, then we're going to call it a day. There is some disagreement as to whether these particular verses ought to not be the end of chapter 4, but rather should be the first words of chapter 5. Otherwise, it seems awfully redundant. I want to offer a different possibility. Verses 1 through 43 are like an introduction, a forward, preamble to what Moses was about to say. And what he's about to say begins in verse 44. And then it continues on for the next several chapters. In other words, perhaps in modern jargon, we'd have Moses saying, Okay, now after all that I've given you as a background, here is finally the teaching I want you to have. So indeed, I would agree with those that say that while the translation is perfectly fine, chapter 5 should have begun a little earlier what is currently designated as Deuteronomy 4, verse 44. And before you start accusing me of trying to change the Bible, please just remember the Bible never had chapter marks. Old Testament or no. Scholars added them many centuries later, but only as a means to help study and communicate these passages. The same goes with verse numbering, by the way. It was an arbitrary system. Nothing wrong with that, because it doesn't change anything. However, because in modern literature, paragraphs and chapters do have a significant meaning, meaning one scene ends and a new one begins, or one thought pattern ends and a new one begins, it can have an impact if we apply that same type of literary criteria to the Bible. What I'm telling you is, try not to read the Bible according to paragraphs and chapters, like we do a modern book. All too often, a certain train of thought simply continues from the last verse of one chapter right under the first verse of the next chapter. But it kind of seems to us, by our literary rules, that this new paragraph or new chapter number tends to, tar tends to start a new context. And what has been set up to that point is different, and now we attempt to create a whole new context from scratch. That's a major mistake. And unfortunately, this is probably the way the vast majority of believers and Bible students and Sunday school teachers, and I can tell you, 
some college professors actually read and teach the Bible. Well, next week we'll take up Deuteronomy chapter 5. So please rise.